This presentation offers a brief introduction to qualitative research in the context of architecture and explains how qualitative research differs from quantitative research. Qualitative research is used in different fields of study to gain insight in a complex phenomenon or process which cannot be grasped with quantitative methods. Also in the field of architecture, such complex phenomena or processes exist. Imagine, for instance, that you want to understand how a blind person experiences space. Addressing this research question with quantitative methods would mean that you collect and analyze measurable data about the phenomenon under study, in this case, measurable data about blindness, as well as measurable data about space. What measurable parameters can we use to characterize space? In architecture, space is typically defined by features of the objects making up its boundaries, and some of these features can be measured. A first set of features you can measure are the dimensions of a space, the height, the length, and the width. Other features that you can measure include the material characteristics of a space's boundaries, for instance, the color of a material can be expressed quantitatively in terms of its hue, saturation, and brightness. Other examples of material characteristics that can be measured include the material's thermal conductivity, specific heat, density, roughness, or absorption coefficient. Yet another measurable feature is a speech transition index, in short, STI which indicates how well people can understand the speaker in the space. An STI can have a value between 0 and 1, where 1 means that the speech intelligibility is excellent. While this feature is characteristic of a space, it is determined by the dimensions and shape of its boundaries on the one hand, and their material characteristics on the other hand, it varies across different positions within the space. For example, you see here how the STI varies across the floor plan of a half-round auditorium where this parameter has been measured in different positions by using an artificial head. According to the measurements, the STI varies between 0.36 and 0.50 with an average of 0.44. If you want to gain a better understanding of the spatial experience of blind people, however, Collecting and analyzing these measurable data about blindness and space do not help you that much. For instance, the fact that in the auditorium just referred to, the speech transition index varies between 0.36 and 0.50, with an average of 0.44, does not tell you much about how it is experienced by blind people. To gain a better understanding of blind people's spatial experience, a qualitative research approach is more suited. When conducting qualitative research, you try to build up such a nuanced view by approaching the phenomenon from different angles. What are possible angles to approach the phenomenon on the study in our imaginary example, the spatial experience of people who are blind? One way in which you could approach it is by reading autobiographies written by blind people and analyzing how they describe space and how they interact with it and experience it. In a book by John Hull, for instance, you could read that since he lost his sight, not only his body changed, but his world seemed to have changed as well. Part of it, the visual part, has simply disappeared. It is not as if it went dark. It just is not there anymore. When a sighted person shuts his or her eyes, the objects that make up his or her visual world are still there for that person. For Hull, these objects have disappeared and others have taken their place, or the objects have changed themselves. For instance, concerning the climate of this environment, he writes, the wind has taken the place of the sun, and a nice day is a day when there is a mild breeze. This brings into life all the sounds in the environment. Oral and tactual qualities make up his world now, but it took some time to learn to perceive this new world in all its richness. In the beginning, the great variety in visual sensations in different places, in particular office spaces, did apparently not translate into the same variety when it comes to oral and tactual qualities. Later, he found out that certain places to make a stronger impression, 
As he mentions, when richly describing a park visit in terms of the sounds of people, the wind he felt, the feeling and trajectory of the path he took, the dimensions of the place, the handrails he touched, etc. The more he learns about this new world, the more he can distinguish between different places and even judge the pleasantness of being there, as he sums up in one of the later sections entitled Touch is Beautiful. Besides reading and analyzing autobiographies, another angle to approach your research question is to conduct face-to-face -face interviews with blind people about their spatial experience. Face-to-face -face interviews are characterized by synchronous communication in time and place, due to which they can take their advantage of social cues. Social cues, such as the interviewee's voice, intonation, body language, etc., can give the interviewer a lot of extra information that can be added to the interviewee's verbal answer to a question. If you want to gain insight in a blind person's spatial experience, social cues are considered important here since the interviewee, the blind person, is considered as a subject, as an irreplaceable person. For example, this is an excerpt from an interview with Carlos Pereira, a Portuguese architect who became blind. In this interview, Pereira explained how, since he lost his sight, space is not only the empty space between visually perceivable objects. He has learned to consider other spatial boundaries than the visual boundaries. In this example, a boundary created by difference in temperature. He explains this with an example. If he moves his hand towards a window, he does not know where the window is, but if the sun touches his hand, his hand is in another space. In this space, which is completely different from the space his hand was in before, it can be very hot. So for him, space is more complex than a visual thing. What used to be perceived visually as empty has become perceivable in its own right. Interviewing people about their spatial experience shows limitations as well. To start with, people are not used to talk about their spatial experience and often struggle to express verbally how they experience the space. Moreover, differences may exist between what people say during an interview and what people do. To address these limitations, you could complement interviews with yet another way of approaching our phenomenon, namely observing blind people while they interact with space. When visiting a building site, for instance, architects typically take pictures of the site and its surroundings. When visiting a building site together with two blind persons, however, these persons drew the attention to the acoustic space. At the front side of the site, the main road through the town is a source of loud continuous noise generated by heavy traffic, so loud that it made a conversation tiresome for them. At the back of the site, the bounding road has a more rural character, with almost no traffic. A fourth way in which you could approach the spatial experience of people who are blind is to analyze buildings and spaces that have been designed explicitly with blind people in mind. Take, for example, the Polytrauma and Blind Rehab Center in Palo Alto, which was designed with the help of Chris Downey. Like Carlos Pereira, Chris Downey is an architect who lost his sight. In designing the lobby of this center, Downey designed the ceiling in such a way to create a similar acoustic space as he experienced under a metal vaulted roof. This roof gave him a distinct sense of direction as the sound of his cane traveled across the length of the roof. If you combine the insights gained by approaching the phenomenon of your study, blind people's spatial experience, then it becomes clear that blind people experience space not merely as the void between the objects that make up its boundaries, but as a filled entity with its own sensory qualities, such as thermal qualities, acoustic qualities, etc. This concept of space as a filled entity with its own sensory qualities is an example of the kind of understanding qualitative research can yield in architecture. In summary, adopting a qualitative research approach in architecture allows to gain a nuanced understanding of a complex phenomenon, such as blind people's spatial experience, by approaching it from different angles. This results in a nuanced view on the phenomenon as experienced by the people involved, in this case, blind people themselves.